I got Brand Brendan Bradley here from various roles. You guys don't know him or do know him. He always kind of introduces himself as the jobber of over 100 jobs. So let's just have a little bit of a chat here. And Brandon, come on over here. Hello. About yourself. <laughs> Did you say announce myself? No, I said uh, introduce yourself a little bit. Introduce myself. Hello, I'm Brendan Bradley. Uh, you might most recently recognize me as the guy on TikTok and Instagram with a pineapple hat as a strike captain at the front lines of Paramount. And every single video I said I'm a jobber from over 100 TV shows, movies, video games, and commercials. So how long have you been doing this? Let's just get right into the first little question. On well, doing it is a weird uh, question because it opens up a lot of questions of what is doing it. I like to think that doing it, acting, being an actor, it's in the name. It's acting. When you are acting, you are an actor. And so I have been involved in the creative arts, especially acting, for over 20 years. As a teenager, my high school did not have an auditorium. There was a lovely community theater about an hour away. My parents graciously drove me some times. And then I started producing my own plays. And that's probably how I got into New York University, where my life was changed by meeting other incredible creative people, as well as living in New York City and auditioning for a professional theater. And I thought I was going to be a little nerdy theater boy for my whole life and career. And then this weird website came along called YouTube. And I was like, well, this is cool. It's like black box theater with a camera. And me and my friends started making videos and series. And I was a part of kind of the early YouTube culture of narrative content content which got me into film and television and led me to my, the whole world that I've built today. Awesome. So what has been the most besides, because we're going to talk a lot about the sag Afra contract, given the whole situation with how people are not so excited. Some people are very excited. And, you know, you had a lot to do with that, like how people understood it. And for non-union people like me, I still don't quite get the whole thing because I know that half of them were fighting for stronger AI protection for people like me, but it's not possible because it's just in the early stages. But you also, though, said recently in a recent video you had, right, um, AI has been around for a while. It's only now just kind of getting scary or whatever, because you said something about how the video game had subtitles and stuff. Maybe I'm wrong. I just... No, no, no. So uh, artificial intelligence as a product, as an idea, has existed for, honestly, decades at this point. Like, we've used machine learning for a lot of things, including, like, subtitles on your Instagram videos and things like that. Like, that's all AI doing its best. Autocorrect on your phone. Um, the question becomes these large learning modules where they actually ingest creative material that they may or may not own um, and then output new, quote-unquote, creative material based off of what... It was fed. And this is kind of a, actually less about a tool, but more about a culture of copyright and the rights of an artist and the rights of any creator when you kind of are repurposing or remixing content. The Copyright Office has actually been very clear for decades about their stance on what is copyrightable and what isn't. What is yours? Like, what is new and what is old? Okay. Um, what belongs to someone else and what belongs to you? And we can continue kind of sitting in the good guidance of that Copyright Office um, or we can throw it out all, you know, throw it all out and, and take these tech companies' words to distrust them that they're going to do something cool and fancy with it. Um, but I think when it comes specifically to the contract and to what we all just fought for, um, sag after has never had any artificial protections in its language because for creative application, this is a relatively new use of the tool. And so uh, the fact is that many, many, many of our members have already been scanned are already being used in artificial AI or AI workflows like post-production, VFX, motion tracking, um, video game creation. And so the question I think that our negotiating committee was, was honestly stuck with, and I think everybody gets to have an opinion about this, but ultimately they came to the best proposition that they could get our employers to agree to was, do you just say, no, there will be no AI, even though we already know you're doing AI, and that means thousands of members have no rights and protections because you're already going to use their image uh, inappropriately. Or are we on the front lines creating the first early language for any protections for this so that it not only protects our actors in some capacity today, but we start creating guidance for non-union actors, for non-creative folk when their material gets used in these systems, for labor across 
the nation and across the world. And so I do think that while, yes, the language is imperfect because it will always be imperfect, it is always a negotiation, we are always going to compromise with our employer. Um, I, I, I am of the mindset that having something rather than nothing is important because I, for example, have been scanned. And up until November 9th, when we had that tentative agreement, there was nothing stopping video game companies, TV companies, movie companies from using my, my material, my voice, my look um, to create digital assets to do whatever they wanted with. And now there is guidelines for what is and isn't allowed. Yeah. So that's why, yeah, because I, th when you break it down like that, to me, it feels like I'm kind of in the same boat. Like I couldn't vote yet, obviously, but I feel kind of the same way. But I've just kept seeing so many people saying this about the turnout, et cetera, and how, you know, very underwhelming it was. So, you know, just compared to the GA. Yes. Can I push back on that slightly yeah. and with love? Yes. The turnout was low because the turnout is always low. Honestly, oh. this was more turnout than we've had in a decade for any of our votes. Okay. So this was actually better than we normally do. We got more okay. people activated probably because they were so passionate. This is um, why if you, this. Of course, if you look at national politics, not everybody votes. It's weird, but not everybody votes. Um, and so we had over 30% of our membership vote, which is honestly very high for us. Um, right. which is very exciting. Um, and then, yes, there was a very vocal um, minority, in this case, of the people who voted. Now, I don't know how many people abstained from voting just because that was their version of saying no. But of the people we know said no, um, I believe it was roughly 30 percent of those who voted. Mm -hmm. So roughly 30 percent of our membership voted at all. Um, I think just under 30 percent of them voted no, um, which means that 70 percent or more voted yes. And, um, and again, that is every member getting to make the best call they right. can based mm -hmm. off of the information that they have. And that's why I was just asking, because I'm glad that you're like respectfully. But this is why I'm asking for other people who might be in the same boat as me. Like we hear how underwhelming it is, according to a lot of these people. But it's also like yeah, you can't believe everything on the Internet or people's comments, even though everyone's entitled to an opinion. People can also say that they didn't vote, but this is their opinion. And that's like, well, if you didn't vote, then you shouldn't really be going on about this. Right, right. I, but well, I, I think that I, I do want to make sure that everybody always feels they are entitled to their opinion. At the end of the day, this is this we were we are always going to have that. It's what it is to be an actor, honestly, and to be an industry member and a union member. The union is a collective body negotiating contracts for all of us. And there's a lot of categories like what I need to be protected by is very different than what a singer needs or a dancer on set or a stunt person, right? Those are completely different categories of worker and our union has to oversee all of them. But this is at the end of the day, a very individuated career. And if we went contract by contract, I've probably signed over the course of my career, a lot of contracts that would make other people uncomfortable. They'd be like, oh, that's a weird loophole. I don't like that. And I'd be like, yeah, I don't either, but I'm going to sign it because I need this job. And so I think that when we get that granular on any contract, what we are participating in as a entire industry is speculative content. We are investing in something today and putting our art and our hearts and our craft on the line. But I think that that's not true for everyone. I've met right. so many people who are like, I absolutely won't do any nudity. I absolutely won't do any simulated sexuality. And I go, fantastic. That's your mm -hmm. journey and your craft and your career. This is mine. And oh, oh. neither are good or bad. But I, but I think that that's a check-in. That, that was a lot of soul-searching with me of like, do I want to do this movie? Do I want to play this role? Do I want to do these things on screen? And the same is true with the contract of me hearing what I think is very, very good instincts from our fellow union members who were concerned about artificial intelligence in general, concerned about this language in general. Um, and I have to tell you that I think what made me more comfortable. And frankly, I think it's interesting that we talk so much about AI because I think there's a lot of other components to this contract. Yes, that we so many about. that I actually, again, as a woman, I... For, for a product that is not going to be finished for several weeks, several months, several years, we have no idea what the outcome of our work is going to be. And it, we're out of control of that. We're not in post-production. We don't control the final marketing strategy. We don't control the final edit. Um, and so... 
I think what moments like this really bring up that are very valid is it's a moment to check in with your career and with yourself and really recognize and give space for the anxiety of what it is to be a performer. This is a tough business and it's a tough career and it's okay to not like all of it. Okay. That's perfectly that's, fine. That's why I'm, yeah, I think a lot of people would feel the same way as me, but it's just like, I definitely am asking a lot of the questions that have been on my mind. Cause people are like, you need to understand it thoroughly. And I'm like, yeah, if I didn't just listen to a three hour podcast and you're a very calming narrator, by the way, I'd like, <laughs> thank you. It's not like I wasn't reading your your stuff, to, like or listening to your stuff to not understand it. Because I think it is good to understand when you're in my position. But yeah, I was just like, you know what? It, it makes a lot of sense when you break it down. But then I'm hearing all these other things. So I guess even for just actors, creators in general, how do you like turn off that voice of everyone else and trying to listen to yourself and what you know? That's a that's. That's a great question, and I don't know that I'm even very good at it. I think that at the end, at the end of the day, you know, what is right for different people is is right for. I, I think that you have to learn that because we are all artists, mm -hmm. we all have our own unique lens on the world, and what makes us special and castable is our unique lens. And so, you in some ways have to trust that while also making sure that you have good guidance, good mentorship. And that you're taking in the material and the information you want. Before we went on strike, I did a movie in which I appeared very naked. There was a lot of, it's not full frontal nudity, but it, there's a lot of nudity in this project. And there are many, many people who would not have been comfortable and frankly were not comfortable who turned down the role before it came to me. Um, and the reason I got the job is that I was comfortable sitting down with the director, discussing how it was going to be used, what the scenes were, how things were going to be simulated and coordinated with other performers, meeting them and getting a sense of comfort around them, um, and what was what what our boundaries were going to be as colleagues. Um, Need a lot of I'm not comfortable with like the nudity, like you said, like you know yeah. your prerogative, you do you, and that's just not me. But I do like seeing more intimacy coordinators on. I do like the, seeing not more the demand for intimacy coordinators. We forced them to commit to intimacy coordinators on every project. Good. Well, that makes me feel so much more comfortable. Me too. Yes. Even like, here's the funny part. Like, I even think about if I ever had to do a spit take, I'd be okay with having an intimacy coordinator because I don't want to spit in someone's face. Like, sure. Yeah. You want to talk that out. Like, like, I don't like I want somebody there just to make sure that it doesn't like happen. And I want to make that clear, too, because, yes, I guess that's the point. But I think that, you know, I saw like a clause about sexual harassment, assault, mm -hmm. all the other things that, you know, just really spoke in. I know there might be tricky language there, too, but it was kind of like a. Aside from the AI problem that everyone had, I was like, you know, this is actually a good contract. Like something that even with my limited knowledge, this sounds like it has more than it's ever offered. So I, I think that I again, I, I think there was a lot that was offered and there was a lot to be worried about. And I think that that is the nature of every contract and every negotiation. I, I feel what is so to me, what, what was so great about this particular contract that I have not felt in other contracts is that I saw a win for every single category, and then I saw the places where we negotiated. I could feel the negotiation that we went through in the room and gone, yeah, okay, we gave a little and we got a little. Okay, I feel good about yeah, that. And I feel that because, again, I totally, like, I've been watching it since the beginning in May, even the WGA strike, and I've gotten to know some incredible people through it and just kind of, like, I feel FOMO, like I wanted to, like I was saying to people, I want to fly to LA or something because there's <laughs> nothing, there's nothing really going on in the Midwest, even though I could get on a six hour car ride to Chicago. And I, I'm not saying nothing, but there was less going on in the Midwest, so I would be searching and it never worked anyway the day. So I was like, I'm just, I would like to just be, I want, I want to be in front of Paramount and doing all that <laughs> But I well, and that's that. Was, go ahead. Yeah. Though so I felt like I'm like I can do this. I'm a part of this. This is good. Other people can do it virtually. Absolutely. One. Well, I think that I want you to continue that sense of empowerment because 
there was a very specific federal labor law about how and where we could strike, and we're just out of control of that. So there were specific strike sites we were allowed to strike. But the interactive agreement is still being negotiated. We have authorized a, a strike if we want one there. We're telling our performance capture artists to decline work right now that isn't under a sag after agreement. Um, and I could see a, a scenario where we virtually, using games, are able to get involved with these game companies because they are online, they are virtual. And so I think we can activate so many more of our members oh, yeah. to support the interactive contract because it's all online. Exactly. And I thought about this because, again, recently, like, you know, you talk about the production companies just starting a unionization. You see the video games now voiceover and it's so funny because like again so many layers go to this like it's not just one but it's funny like where you think oh animators should be a part of the writers guild and a lot of people agree with that and it's wrong yeah. and then how production just started to work alongside more so why do you think it's taken that long too, given the situation? Because everybody's been around for a long time, like acting's been around a long time. You know, they started the SAG and, you know, WGA. But why do you think it took so much longer if you have any idea about like production and animated writers, et cetera, you know? Because like we said, too many, la well, not too many layers, but so many layers. I mean, I think that the, it changes slow. It's annoyingly slow in every single facet of the world. Like human change is always very difficult. Um, you know, there's a phenomenal amount of money and power that has always been leveraged at trying to fracture labor, fracture employees, fracture up people. Because when people come together, they do really cool things. And when we can keep them isolated and keep them separated and bickering amongst themselves, then we can usually take advantage. And so I think that when we look at the gains historically that any union has made or any core labor movement has made, it has been in these slow, isolated steps. Um, and where that really comes into is the remarkable responsibility and power that non-union performers have as well, um, or non-union enter entertainers or industry folk have, because when you're taking a non-union job, you are allowing them to have the product without having gone through the proper protocols and channels. And this is always a dance that we're doing of, can you convert that project over to a union project and get your card? Or can you all organize within your you know, small bakery and make it go union? Um, it, it's, this, it's this slow tactical um, game of progress of people trying to decide when is the right moment to give up some of the current livelihood and opportunity to be able to have a future longevity. Awesome. Yeah, because again, I said no to a lot of non-union projects that would have probably helped me get a SAG card eventually. But then even though I didn't understand and they said, though, it would probably be OK to be in it, like depending on what it was. I just personally didn't feel comfortable. Like I had so many opportunities. And the funny thing is like those projects winded up getting canceled because nobody was, which is sad, but it shows what you mean by the whole non-union, how much I didn't think like I had power. You know what I mean? Like we don't think sure. we have a lot to power through. We don't have a lot of understanding until you really take a step back and you go, well, I've also been taking classes. I've been understanding business of acting and all this stuff. I, like so many other, probably have actually been very much a part of this strike like any other. I just don't have my card yet because I'm kind of in that intermediate stage where I've had a lot of roles like as either guest background, guests or whatever, but nothing like super big. And that's okay. Like that's, you, you have to take baby steps. But right as I was about to start getting into maybe some of those, like where I would get a co-star or a guest star, mm -hmm. meeting a roles, I just got an agent, all this stuff. It suddenly is like, oh, the strike happened, but that's okay. We can't get mad at the strike because the strike actually finally gives you like healthcare and all that stuff. Sure, sure. Well, and also, you know, you can be protected by a union contract, even if you are non-union. If yeah. you work a project that is under a union contract, you enjoy all those protections, okay. even if you're not a member. And so in a lot of ways, if you can convert a project over and they've got, you know, five, you know, SAG members, but then they need five other people, um, and you happen to be the person that they want to cast or is available to be cast. There's a whole Taft-Hartley system. There's a way for them to make you membership eligible on a project. 
Um, there's a way to compel you to have to like join in order to cast you. Um, but that means they're committing to you that they're going to cast you. So all of us that are in the union were non-union at one point in time. And we exactly. all worked our way up uh, the exact same way you're describing. And yeah. And the problem that I run into, because I was on a few as like um, game shows too early on when I first started and game shows are kind of a tricky reality TV where, you know, they're right. not really, but some people say you shouldn't put that on your resume, even though it is a, it says give you credit. So I put it on anyway. I don't, I understand casting directors might not like it, but it was a real credit for me. Like sure. I was in sure. it and I understand it was just me, but how do you feel when like some of that black and white terminology is used? Like, I know that you might not teach or help out with like more beginner actors or developmental actors, like some people or you might not have as much knowledge in that as much with the casting thing, but do you feel like we sh like people who are just beginning should put that stuff on just to show that they've had some work done or should they just leave it off because it's technically just you on a show? Well, I'll, I'll take a step back even further. Um, I, w during COVID, right, everything shut down. Um, and I then was trying to go back to getting like a more normal steady job, like not kind of a side hustle where I was putting in a few hours a week, but to actually get like a job job. Mm -hmm. And I was talking to my brother-in-law about this and he was explaining to me all the different resumes I needed to have for all the different jobs because a resume isn't meant to be this one fits all catch all. It's supposed to be targeted for the job that you want. So I can understand you saying, well, this is on-camera experience. I want to list this on-camera experience. But I can also understand the casting saying, well, that on-camera experience isn't really relevant to this job. So in some ways, I think it's a little bit of both. I think you need to tailor the resume that's dressed for the job you want, right? You need to tailor the resume for the job that you're probably going to book next, even if you are taking off credits. I went through this okay. when I was in New York. I worked I did over 100 plays in New York City. I took off a lot of the theater because it wasn't specifically guiding casting towards the type of theater I wanted to get cast on or the type of theaters I wanted to work at. And so I used all of that as clay to sculpt the resume that I wanted for the jobs that I was hoping I was going to audition for. Okay, so that does make a lot of sense. And yes, I've had a great guide along the way of how to make it work. Because again, we had to take off a few things. And then we of kept course. a few things, obviously, because it works because it's streaming. even And it's a television show that gave me credit. But I'd say I only have two things that would really get me SAG credit that I need to build up, which you're right. But yes, I go through this with my own communication and all that stuff. Like I have to write like three different degrees stuff, like uh -huh. with what degrees I have, three different ways of a resume. So you are definitely helpful in that case, like of why you're doing that. So um, oh, and it never stops. I keep forgetting every month. Like, I'm like, up. Oh, I got to go back on Actors Access and I got to massage that a little bit. That thing's going to come off. That thing's going to go on. You know, it isn't a, I did my resume, I'm done. <laughs> it will always be an evolving. I recently redo my entire resume because I got an agent finally, which is good. And, um, and they're an amazing agency, but they're not responding right now because I have to remind myself we just got off the strike and they're trying to find jobs. For everyone. We got off a strike and we're about to go into the holidays. It's going to yeah. be a very right. weird, quiet time for everybody. Emailing just because they wanted to get me started right away. But then I realized it's okay, Sarah. You're not, you're not yeah. doing anything wrong. You're not bugging them. They're just, they don't have anything to tell you. So they're just not responding. And that's where I'm glad to hear from you as well about that. Like I hear from a lot of people, but at least you saying the thing about it being a quiet time. Yeah. I, not a quiet place where John could just <laughs> Exactly. That's a, that's a different situation. If you're in that situation, you should get out immediately. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, so that was, so what was, um, as we kind of wrap up here, what was your, what was your first SAG job, would you say? My first SAG job would be, I did a bunch of background work in New York City. When I first was joining the union, you had to get five waivers um, on a SAG project. So you basically had to been when you're on SAG background or sta SAG stand-in work, they need to maintain a certain number of like a certain number of SAG people. Mm -hmm. So if you're non-union and they don't have that number of SAG people, they will give you a waiver to make you SAG for the day. 
basically. It's like a little upgrade you get on set. Mm -hmm. And at the time, you had to get five of these to be eligible to join the union. And so I would work dozens of different background and stand-in jobs, getting a, like one waiver here, two waivers on this job, like piecing them together slowly. And it wasn't until Robert De Niro did The Good Shepherd, which was a movie with Matt Damon and Angelina Jolie, and they needed a group of guys that were going to be like Matt Damon's college buddies that would go throughout different moments across the movie. And that gave me enough days on set that just statistically a couple of those days they had to waiver me. And I finally got my five waivers. You are definitely giving me some questions that I have to have with SAG because I did. I was an audience member on Dr. Phil for four episodes. I was in a But that might not be considered again, this was all under the TV theatrical agreement. And Dr. Phil might be a basic cable agreement or a, you have to always look at what, what contract you're under and what the rules are for that contract. I know. I just meant that that made me think because I was like, no, I might not be, but I'm always like awkward spot where maybe I should in some ways. I, I mean, in some ways. Yeah, I look, look for the look at the contract. You know, you can always find what contract that show is under and then figure out whether or not you were eligible through it. You can also always you as a non-union member can always call the SAC after membership department. OK, Um they they are you, you shouldn't do it every day, but like they are there to answer questions about what it is to join the union and about contracts that you're encountering or jobs that you're encountering. So you can ask them questions about the industry. And so ask them to, you know, run your name and see if maybe you're applicable or run those those shows and see if they were under the contract that would make you eligible to join. OK, and then as we're kind of, you know, wrapping up here, because I know you got to go, sure. but. So what has been your favorite TV show to be on and favorite movie? Because I know you've done a variety of things. So do you That's have a favorite or is that a, so, such a loaded question that I can't even? It's, it's a loaded question because it's like choosing children. And all of them have brought me immense kind of joy and education and experience. But you know, before we started recording, you mentioned a particular project, and that particular project happens to be the first television show I ever formally booked yes. through like well, going in the room the and auditioning. This was my, yeah, so I had a little conversation just because I wanted to make it less awkward on screen because we haven't really talked in real life, even though everything's good. We're kind of the actor communicators here, but so it's a little more relaxed, but I just wanted to have like a five minute conversation before we started just to make sure. But yeah, you played, did you play, I feel like you played grandpa, like a young version of the grandpa russo was i play i played their grandfather when they went back in time so basically yeah. they go back in time and i am the grandpa <laughs> even though what how old were you that like 20 at the time i i was like 25 or something like i was so young and it was my first i again i'd done youtube and i'd made my own shows my own sketches i'd exactly. auditioned a bunch but you know you never know how much of a hold those shows are gonna have on you know, when I've heard even people talk about it multiple times, they talk about that episode being one of the most iconic episodes because they kept going back in time. And season three had some of the best episodes, in my opinion. Yeah. So, like, great. But I loved Misfortune Beach, aside from the go back in time. But it was all, like, around the same time. And I'm like, you know what? The weirdest part is, like, even though one episode people can say, sometimes those characters don't, like, stand out. But I'm like, everybody still to this day remembers Grandpa Russo. <laughs> like, the young Grandpa Russo. He's, yes. He's definitely one of the most iconic characters I've gotten to play, which is exciting that I get to constantly meet people who have seen something I did. How many people have actually stopped you, though, for the Wizards thing? No one's... I, I don't think people have stopped me. They've come up to me at other events. And and often it's at other events for other projects, and it's always very awkward that they're like, yeah, yeah, you just did this thing, but let's talk about Wizards. And I love it. I love getting to nerd out about the show, because it was a great show, and it was a true family. They really were yes, an exactly. on-set family. And uh, the funniest part is, like, dad so much, because it's a lot... Like, like we have so many similar culture stuff and then it was just like so funny absolutely and well and david david Luiz was really the dad of that whole on set show he oh, really like took care of everybody he knew all the crew like exactly. he welcomed me to the it was great well i get that vibe from him when i see him whenever i see him i get that you're kind of the dorky dad but i can live yeah with 
So that's good. So he's definitely one of like your best experiences there. Yeah, it was my first real experience on a television set um, where I actually had a job, um, like a speaking role. And um, and it was just it was really magical to be welcomed in that much and for it to have this longevity, whereas okay. like other things I've done have been like a show no one's watched or a pilot that, you know, didn't go or whatever. And so um, I, it's just really special that that was my first one. And to kind of give um, something for your for your listeners, because I created so much of my own work, my agent, when I booked Wizards of Waverly Place, called me crying. And she said, I, can I curse on your podcast? Go ahead. You've said you okay. had stuff she, about nudity. Yes, you can curse. Yeah. yeah, okay, great. <laughs> the content warnings on this episode will be all over the place. Um, but, <laughs> it's explicit and people can't really look at it. So. But so she called me up crying and she said, you have so much weird shit on your resume. But now that but now that Disney has hired you, we can get you other jobs. And, exactly and she was right. How, and it's great. But that's exactly how I'm feeling. I have so much weird shit on my resume. And yes, now having whatever might come. But it sounds really good. And how long do you usually stay on set for those like little, little roles? So it all depends. So for for that, for example, the way that shoots is it's a multicam sitcom. So it means that you're rehearsing the whole week leading up to the filming in front of the studio audience with four cameras. And so it means that you keep, get to keep going back every day and rehearsing little pieces. Whereas if it's a single camera show, like a lot of my other work, you come on for just the days that the scenes you're in are filming. So if that's one scene, like I did elementary for CBS and I was just there. Well, I was technically there for more days because I was playing three people. But each of those people basically got one day on set. And had I just been one of those three people, I would have just gone to set and done that scene. And that would have been it. So, and then last thing, you did start your own movie, right? Didn't recently you just started um, making your own film that came out? So I made, I made my first feature film in 2017. It's called Non-Transferable. It's a romantic comedy um, and it's distributed all over the place. So you can see that. Um, I wrote another movie that was like an adaptation of Macbeth that uh is still kind of figuring out what to do with it uh we i finished it during COVID. i would have like taught myself 3d animation to finish it oh, and wow. then i wrote a movie called the plus one that stars ashanti and cedric the entertainer and it came out in theaters during the strike and i couldn't talk about it and so now i could talk about it and it's you made, like, on spider -Man, places, spider -Man places a few weeks ago like where you know tom hall and toby mcguire and um Andrew Garfield would like where they yeah. would hide and watch the movie and watch people's reaction like again and uh, like not trying to name I just meant that it was reminding me so much of that like where they were so incognito and I'm like are you like trying to avoid people noticing that the guy <laughs> who wrote the, <laughs> the movie was in there like the guy that's so yeah, I was just curious because you talked a little bit about some of your other projects and one of the films that you wrote kind of directed, but I didn't realize it was in 2017, but you talked about like the different contracts when it came up early. So I was just kind of curious, like how much more work did you have to do when you become like a director, producer, actor of said film? Oh, I mean, I would say that, you know, as an actor, I'm in charge of one character, but as a director or a writer, I'm in charge of all the characters. <laughs> and so it's exponentially more work. And as a producer, you're then in charge of the entire team. You're in charge of making sure everyone gets fed and everybody's safe and, you know, right. everybody's contract is up to date. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for interviewing and talking about this. It's been great. Um, of course. Thank you. Yeah. Anything else that you want to say quick, like where people can follow you? I am Brendan A. Bradley on all of the social media platforms, unless you want to say mean things and then I'm not on social media. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Well, great talking to you. This has been Jen's. You and we will see you soon. Bye. Bye.